On an island in Northern Ireland, a disturbing creature terrorizes those who dare to venture near. This big giant head that swung around and suddenly it's staring me. This guy was huge. The wife was there and most of her insides were outside. There is something quite large making quite large kills on the island. It's known as the Dovar coup. Mysterious, yes. And maybe all wild places have a bit of mystery to them. Ireland is breathtaking scenery and savage nature. Visitors get lost in its emerald green plains never far from the roar of the sea. Here, the fantastic and the far-fetched form part of the local culture. From lucky charms to ghost stories, century-old Irish legends live on among the locals, eager to pass them on. But one Irish monster has caused more of a stir than the others. A creature resembling a giant otter that emits a blood-curdling scream the Dovar coup. Sean Corcoran believes he encountered the creature in 2003. He had the scare of his life while camping with the family on Omi Island, northwest of the country. It was 2003. My wife Miranda and I took off um, on a holiday around Ireland and we decided to stay on an island just off of the mainland called Omi Island. Uh, we parked the jeep uh, right at the centre of the island, really, uh, next, quite close to the lake. There's a freshwater lake in the centre of the island. And we set up camp there. It was a lovely evening. Um, we had a tent, so we went, by the time we had gone to bed, um, we heard we'd, lights out. We were literally nearly asleep. And the next thing, uh, we heard some noises uh, down at the lake. This particular night, we were sound asleep and we got woken by a really, really loud splashing noise. It was about two o'clock in the morning. And I suppose we were feeling a bit mischievous. So we decided, let's go down and have a look. And we tiptoed down across the short grass, the 15 or 20 meters to the, the edge of the lake. And I turned on the head torch. And there in front of us, as close as you are to I, uh, was the creature. I kind of almost see it as this big giant head that swung around and suddenly it's staring me meanly in the face. And it got up on its back legs and just really hissed at the two of us really loudly. It was just like, oh my God, what is that? And within seconds, uh, it swam across the lake, climbed up onto a boulder on the other side, and we never saw it again. And that was it. And we were kind of left standing there speechless. What was that? After that, we went for our lunch over to the local pub on the mainland, and we were sitting there and we were saying, well, well, we asked them, what do you think? So we did, we said it to them. The whole pub went quiet. So we were like, ooh, we've uncovered something here. You know, our love affair for Omi began then. The pub the Corcorans are talking about is Sweeney's, located on the shore facing Omi Island in the city of Claddagduff. Mary Sweeney is the pub's owner, and despite herself, the village's amateur historian and spokeswoman. Here, everyone knows Mary. Sweeney's Bar, cladded off, I suppose, were known as the information point for Omi. The area that we live in is um, a very beautiful area, as you see. We're overlooking Omi Island, which is uh, a very special island. It's really... Uh, the jewel in Connemara. Over the years, uh, the Office of Public Works would have uh, spent some money in doing an excavation over there to see what period uh, it would all have dated back to. And they've come up with some very interesting finds. Michael Gibbons is an archeologist. According to him, Olmi Island is a place rich with history, even if it is now deserted. Well, the island was first settled six, 7,000 years ago. And like everywhere else here, it's got episodic pulses of settlement onto the island over that period. So you've had hunter-gatherer populations came there 8,000 years ago. 6,000 years ago, agriculture was developed here, adopted from the continent. 2,500 BC, this beautiful pottery has been exposed by the storms. 
and so on, a whole pattern of episodic waves of settlement. When the climate is warm and dry, people expand out onto these islands. When it gets wet and cold and miserable, bogs grow, landscape changes, and people are driven off the edges uh, from the marginal land onto the better land. In the 1840s, of course, you had the Great Famine, which wiped out this area, where you had cannibalism recorded in the Clifton district. That's how bad the, the famine was here. So there's lots of abandoned homes, abandoned farms from the 1840s and 50s here. Shane Dunphy recently made a documentary for Irish Public Radio on the creature of the Omi Island, the terrifying Dovar Coup. There's something very peaceful and something very wild and something very lonely about the island. I have to say that if, if there's anywhere in Ireland where there's going to be a monster or a boogeyman, Omi Island is an ideal spot, it's an ideal location. You could believe that something, something strange would make its home there. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Veely now. In ever mysterious Ireland, one man dedicates his life to creatures not yet identified by science. I am Ronan Coughlin, one of the few cryptozoologists in Ireland. If you don't know what a cryptozoologist is, it's somebody who studies animals that are rumored to exist, but whose existence has not been proven. The sense of mystery has always enveloped me. I have always felt there is far more to life than we know. Sean Corcoran has shared his monster encounter with various specialists. I suppose down through the years, uh, we've been asked by uh, lots of people in television, uh, newspaper, magazines, books, authors, uh, people who are into cryptozoology have come to us and said, what was it like? So as an artist myself, I've actually done, uh, done some digital drawings uh, to represent what I imagine it must have looked like. He is not someone who claims to have seen this while staggering home at night from the pub, a bottle of Guinness in one hand and a bottle of whiskey in the other. His sighting was under the right conditions. Secondly, being an artist, he had an eye for detail and took things in. He was, of course, able to make reproductions of what he had seen. So all in all, he is what would be regarded as a reliable witness. It's a kind of a, like a large uh, otter-like creature with a very large head, um, possibly teeth. Very scary face. Uh, it definitely had a tail. Uh, it could swim as fast as any creature, you know, any kind of water-like creature like uh, an otter or anything like that. And we watched what to me looked like two huge, big, reddy, orange flippers just swimming across the lake. It was about the size of a man. This guy was huge. You know, you wouldn't just pick it up and walk away with it. Well, you certainly wouldn't be approaching this creature because the way it snarled, it was definitely not happy. After a few years of Sean researching, that um, we discovered that there was a creature there called the Dover Coo. This disturbing creature seen by Corcoran has haunted the banks for centuries. You can pronounce it Dovahu or Dorhu. In Ireland, the earliest mention I know of regarding the Dovahu is that of Roderick O'Flaherty, who lived in the 17th century. He describes how someone he knew was set upon by it on one occasion and it seized the unfortunate traveler's head in its jaws. The traveler had a bit of a think as the otter was dragging it into the water. And suddenly, he remembered he had a knife in his pocket. He doesn't seem to have been the quickest of thinkers, but he pulled this out, plunged it into the Duvarku, which dived back into the water. About a century later, a tragic incident was reported from Glenad Lake. 
On this occasion, a man named Connolly was wondering why his wife was taking so long doing the washing in the lake. Down he went to the lake to discover an horrendous sight. The wife was there, and most of her insides were outside, and the Duvaku was tucking into them. And if you go into the graveyard near where the incident occurred, you'll find the tombstone of the unfortunate woman and a very curious beast that looks like a cross between a dog and an otter is carved on the tombstone. This is said by locals in hushed tones, because you always speak of such things in hushed tones, to be the beast which killed his wife. And Corcoran is not the only one to have seen the Dovar coup recently. In the 1960s, um, again around the Galway region, there was a series of sightings. Um, a lady was hanging out the clothes in her back garden on the shores of Strahin Lock, and uh, literally one apparently came up out of the lake into her garden and she spotted it. Uh, there was a doctor driving home from a, a house party late at night, and one ran across the road in front of his car. And all of these sightings were recorded and reported in the newspapers of the time. And when I started speaking to people, particularly people living in the west of Ireland, there was almost an acceptance that it's really there, that it is part of the flora and fauna of, of Ireland. So I, I decided that the only thing that I could do was really go to Omi Island, which is a t small tidal island off the west coast of Ireland, just off Connemara. And I, I decided I would spend a few days there camping out, uh, bring my recording equipment with me, because I had this notion of making a radio documentary about it. And um, I, I did, and I went out there expecting to find absolutely nothing, but to spend a lovely few days bird watching and enjoying myself, having a little bit of solitude and I recorded a little over six hours of this atmospheric sound. Uh, when I sat down and started putting that documentary together, I was cutting out bits of, of my six hours of Atmos and overlaying them. And I was playing back listening to it when I heard this very strange sound coming over and I realized it was coming from this Atmos track. So I immediately went back to my original recording and I discovered that at about 8.38, on that first evening, my Zoom box had recorded about three minutes of a very, very unusual sound. And it did send some shivers down my spine when I heard it first. It's just a few moments of kind of bird noise and atmos first. It'll come in now in a sec. There you go. The mysterious Omi Island is located in the Connemara region in the northwest of Ireland. For the archaeologist Michael Gibbons, the island and its surroundings are a must-see for anyone wanting to discover Ireland. If stones could talk, those on Omi Island would tell all of Ireland's history. The landscape is so diverse, it's like one vast history book that the pages are still being found and revealed, so it's very exciting as an archaeologist. We're looking out on, um, on Cleggan Bay in the northwest tip of Connemara, which is on the very westernmost part of Ireland. On the east side of the beach, you have a small megalithic tomb, which dates to around 3000 BC. And on the west side of the beach, behind us, overlooking it, there's a children's burial ground, children who died without baptism. Under Catholic canon law, were forbidden to be buried in consecrated ground. So either side of the, the beach, you have five millennia of Irish history. Connemara, it's like a continent in miniature. The center of it has a series of mountain ranges. The western and southern edges glacially scoured with beautiful bays and inlets. So it's almost like a little island in itself. It's got every possible landscape known to man. And of course, the sea dominating it and getting its name from the sea, the Connemara. 
So along the shore here, you've got successive layers of settlements over millennia. So the very bottom of it is 7,000 years old. But these walls are from an abandoned village from medieval times on top. So you get these layers of history, one on top of the other. So what we're looking at here is a megalithic tomb. And inside it, you will have dozens of burials, mostly cremation burials with pottery vessels, stone artifacts, lithics, and so on inside it. This site itself has never been excavated. And the earliest of them date back to 3,800 BC. So we found about 40 of these tombs. We have this extraordinary 18th and 19th century abandoned homes scattered throughout the west of Ireland, but particularly in the Connemara region. It's one of the really nice things about exploring the Irish landscape. Every round, every corner, there's antiquities. To understand the origin of Dovarku, we must return to the very roots of Irish history. This creature has been part of Irish mythology for over a millennium. Dovarku, from my knowledge, is a kind of a, you know, it's a half otter, half dog creature that was of, of quite scale. And I suppose if you look back in the historic uh, annals in Ireland, there's, there's archives of creatures uh, like this killing people and attacking people and running after people through Connemara and stuff like that down through the centuries. The Dovar who originally appears in the Oceanic cycle of Celtic mythology. It's set around the time of Christ in Ireland and it describes this kind of Celtic twilight world where gods and men are, are, are fighting and having all sorts of high adventures. And the Dovar who in that story is supposed to be the king of the otters. It's supposed to be a very, very large otter with a white cross on its breast. Remember, this is the beginning of Christianity in Ireland. But somehow it has made the leap from the pages of folklore into the real lives of people in 21st century Ireland. And uh, I think that that's a, that's a very interesting point and it's something that fascinates me a lot, the, the transmission of these, of these stories. It is certainly a plausible kind of animal. It's not a three-headed monster that breathes fire from one end and fumes from the other. Well, it may breathe fumes from the other, but I don't really know. They inhabit the wild country. Now, there's a lot of wild country in the west of Ireland. There, thunderous breakers smash against crags on the seashore. Wild grasses that have never known the farmer's scythe grow in a state of pristine purity. Lakes that humans rarely, if ever, walk past are to be found there. It is in such places the Duva who is found and also off the coastline. There's one theory that they come inland to drink fresh water from freshwater lakes. It seems to be quite capable of coming up on the shore, as we have heard from the legends, and devouring the odd passerby if it happens to want a snack. These ancient legends, handed down from generation to generation, have made the Irish born storytellers. We are a, a nation of storytellers. We love a story, a good story. Whether it's a true story or a not true or a non-true story or a folklore or a slightly exaggerated, but you know, the ones that have an element of truth to them are they make for interesting stories, whether they can be scientifically proven or not. Legend has it that this creature is there on Omi. The fact that Sean saw something that fits the bill, having not heard of it before no, he saw it. it like to him, it was this midnight, late night fright. <laughs> um, so it wasn't, it wasn't something that was stirred by imagination that he was uh, seeing after hearing all these stories, that he was on the lookout for something to spin a yarn on himself or to tell a story. I saw that thing. I mean, he just came across this by, by, by chance and it just happens to fit into what is a wonderful legend and story, or maybe not legend and story, maybe fact, and never let the truth or untruth get in the way of a good story, as the, as the saying goes. Omi Island is just one kilometre or half a mile from the shore. And yet, once there, visitors have the impression of being completely cut off from the world. 
the sense of isolation is total. There's something very peaceful and something very wild and something very lonely about the island. Um, I remember that, that first night that I was there, you, you sit there and you watch the tide coming in and enclosing you. There's a real sense that you have been, you've been cut off from the world and in some ways it's like kind of stepping into a time machine because, you know, the island is, 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 is pretty much the same as it was back in the, the Stone Age. Uh, the, the lake itself is in a kind of a basin. Um, in the right in the center of the island. It's, it's a freshwater lake. One thing that I did discover was some very, very large animal droppings with very large mussel shells in them. These could be found around the lake. And I also came across the freshly killed body of a greater black-backed gull. This is the largest seabird that we have in Ireland. They, they're very, very large animals. They've got a wingspan of over five feet in length. You would want to be quite a large animal to take down one of these. So there is something quite large, making quite large kills on the island. Um, but as I've said, what it is, I'm really not sure. There is an atmosphere there that not everybody sees or, or, or appreciates or feels. But f I suppose for me, really, when you're on the island and the tide closes behind you, then you can really experience kind of like being cut off from the rest of the world, being cut off from the mainland, and that's a really kind of a beautiful sensation. Mysterious, yes. And maybe all wild places have a bit of mystery to them. And it is, it is it's, it's remote and it's out there. And I suppose there's a, a, the, the fact that you're cut off from the mainland for half of the time that you're there because it's a tidal island you drive out to the island when the tide is low and then the tide comes up around you so that there's that maybe slight tension that's created from being cut off from the mainland for stretches of time in addition to being a place filled with mystery omi island also offers the unique opportunity to capture a living monster, says cryptozoologist Ronan Coglin. If you go swimming in the area they've been reported and you find something sinking its teeth into your leg, then you may have proved the existence of the Duvahu. Fame and fortune will await you. The Nobel Prize for Science will be thrust in your face. This fan of mythic monsters and local legends prepares to confront the Dovar coup for the first time. I've not been to Omi Island, but I'm sure I'll familiarize myself with it fairly quickly. And uh, if the Dovar coup should emerge and show fierce uh, tendencies, you will be quite surprised at how fast I can run bearing my age in mind. Let's go. Fearing nothing. There are no highways to Cladigduff, the village facing Omi Island. Visitors have to take the scenic Sky Road, which runs along the ocean. To get there from the capital city of Dublin, it takes about three hours by car. Well now, there is the place we seek, just outside Cladigduff. We should arrive there in three spaces of time. We want to get there before nightfall, because after nightfall it is said that the Duvahu emerges from its watery lair. If there is any anomalous animal out there, no matter how quietly we proceed, it'll hear us coming. Let us just hope it isn't in a hungry mood and is lurking behind a hedge waiting for our arrival. There are two low tides each day. Miss your window and you'll be on the island overnight. It's pretty much the kind of topography I expected. And in the midst of it is uh, Fahi Lake where this uh, creature was allegedly seen. But until the tide goes down, we won't be able to walk over there. But everything comes to him who waits, as they say. Patience is a virtue. There have always been the wild places, the places where it is said that angels feared to tread. It is in such places the Duva who is found and also off the coastline. 
This is a fine vantage point. You get the complete vista of the lake. Yes, this would seem to be the place to watch from. There's one theory that they come inland to drink fresh water from freshwater lakes. It certainly could swim down to here, get out and go down to the lake. There are huge patches of dung of some kind of animal here. Quite a large animal from the destruction it has left in its wake. Come forward and mind where you step. We're approaching Lake Fahi now. I wonder if you can hear the chill breeze blowing in from the lake. Does it portend a sudden surprise, I ask myself. The Tufaku is said to emerge at nighttime. As it's the middle of the day, our chances of seeing anything odd are somewhat limited. But if we continue to scan, you never know. Sean Corcoran saw something, something that seemed so unusual, so out of the ordinary, it gave him a terrible fright. Let us see if we can get round to the other side of the lake and see what we might find. I suspect this path is man-made, but if it was made by the Duva who, he did us a great service. The waters of the lake look as though they could conceal just about anything. They're certainly large enough to contain a monster of the type the Duva who is supposed to be. Now, if you take a good look, that rock out there looks like it's the head of something, but of course it's only a rock. However, in the wrong visibility, it could be mistaken for an animal. With a little touch of imagination and perhaps a drop of whiskey in you, you could easily make that out to be an otter of unusual size. Now, there are considerable signs of droppings, particularly in the wilder side over there, but I think we may attribute those to cattle let onto the uh, grassy verges of the lock from time to time. There is no way I know of that could be used to make the Duvahu surface, to summon the Duvahu, as it were, and lead it onto the shore. The only thing one can do is watch and wait. Now, as it was seen under cover of darkness, someone who was supposed to camp out overnight might be more lucky. In this small corner of Ireland, local folklore of the Dovar coup is enthusiastically embraced. But scientists are reluctant to grant that such an improbable creature exists. My name's Dr. Colin Lawton. I'm a mammal ecologist in zoology in NUI Galway, which is the university in Galway City here in Ireland. Being an island, it's difficult for the animals to make it here. Now, some of them are brought in by humans and some of them made it here on their own bat. Um, but generally what you would have uh, on an island like this, you would have otters and stoats and rabbits and maybe foxes and quite a lot of small animals like uh, wood mice, maybe shrews, those sorts of things. They get to about a metre 20, a metre 30 in length, which is about four foot in length, but um, that would be as big as they'd get. Uh, they wouldn't really get up to the sort of seven foot long. That I, that I heard of. <laughs> there is no proof that would be acceptable to a mainstream scientist that it exists. On the other hand, there is a considerable body of anecdotal evidence which in previous cases of unknown species has led eventually to the discovery and scientific acceptance of the species. Now, what is it that we don't know that's going on around about us as we go through life. There could be animals hiding in the densest forest 
which have not been discovered. In fact, no scientist would deny there are animals that have not been discovered, but they like to think that all the big ones have been discovered. You're never too far away from a house and there are people about and a, a large animal, I would be surprised if one was able to get around without being noticed more often than, than perhaps the records have shown. Let's walk along the shore a bit and see if we can discover. Because if the Duvaku ever comes out on the shore, any droppings it leaves will be on the beach. I don't think we're going to be very lucky. According to Dr. Colin Lawton, it is not a mythical Dovar coup, but humble otters that have disturbed unsuspecting visitors to the island. They spend most of their active time in the water, but then they, um, they come out of the, the water and they nest on land. So they nest in holts, just in the banks of the, uh, the lake or river, or even just along the, the beach. So um, you would be talking about something that's resident in the country, and you would, um, I, I would expect that we would have seen it and recorded it um, quite regularly, given the size of the animal. And for the rest of the evening, this is the place to stage the lookout. Down there, on the very edge where I can look out from that uh, slightly elevated piece of ground over the whole of the lake. And snugly ensconced in my car, I shall keep my eyes out for the dreadful Duvarku. Scientists can be rather na narrow-minded sometimes about where the boundaries of the possible lie. We're all like that a bit, I suppose, because e each of us has a kind of boundary of the possible. I would find it very difficult to believe in it. I, I'd like to keep an open mind and, uh, and, and things, and, uh, but this is a story that would be particularly difficult to um, to believe in simply because as a mammal ecologist who goes out looking for tracks and signs of, of mammals, it's the, the way that we actually work on the animals because they tend to be reclusive and stay away from humans. Um, I think we would have found signs of it. Um, if people are, have seen it, then you would expect it would be much easier to find the signs that they leave behind. A prisoner of the tides, Ronan Coglin is preparing to spend the night on Omi Island. He hasn't given up hope of encountering the Dovar coup. With Sean Corcoran, who had a sighting of the otter, his wife said she was sure it had flippers rather than paws on the back. But as the sighting was at night, this could have been due to misperception. It seems to be a very large and very dangerous kind of otter. Don't go out sort of dangling fish over the water in the hope that the Bouvercou will bite it, because it'll probably take your arm off as well. Despite their terrifying encounter with the Dovar coup, the Corcorans remain attached to Omi Island. For them, this remote land will always be magical. The grass is very short, there's rabbits everywhere, there's beautiful granite and limestone boulders everywhere, and like the, beautiful, the landscape change, oh, and the sky, the sky in Omi, like when you look at the landscape and then you see the sky and the way the clouds come across it or a rainstorm comes, it's absolutely beautiful. For his part, Ronan Coglin dared to spend the night on Omi Island, lulled by the sounds of the mysterious island. I've played this sound to biologists and um, animal call experts, particularly um, marine animal experts, and none of them have been able to identify what it is, so I'm completely perplexed. The only thing that I can imagine is that I caught the call of the, the Dovar Who. 
And did the cryptozoologist have his hoped-for encounter with the Dovar coup? Well, I'm afraid we were unlucky this time. The water was unbroken all night. No head of the Dovar coup raised itself above. But there's always another day. One can always return. And in the meantime, the waters of the lake glide silently and slowly, covering whatever secrets lie beneath them. Yeah, we told quite a few people. Most people, as I said, thought we were kind of just pulling their leg. Um, it's taken people till now, actually, to realize that um, we weren't. Most people just thought, all right, yeah, Sean and Miranda, yeah. <laughs> I suppose I spent um, seven or eight years drawing the map. Every time we went back, I'd draw another little bit, put it away again, and, you know, that next year we might travel down again, I'd draw another little bit of the map and try and fit the pieces of the puzzle together. I don't believe in spaceships from outer space, so, like, I mean, I'm not... I have never witnessed anything like this before. I don't, I don't have a bookcase full of cryptozoology books. I'm, you know, I, I'm an artist. This is something that uh, my wife and I witnessed. Um, so I don't, I don't really, I, I, if it's a freak of nature or some kind of a giant species of otter uh, or whatever it might be, I leave that to the experts. But I know what we saw and, you know, it's, uh, it'll stick with us forever, I'm sure. I'm not really concerned about what it is, to be honest. Like, um, whether it's the Dover coup or whether it's, I mean, I just know what I saw. And what I saw was this big giant creature thing right up in my face. And uh, so... The story, that's the story, that's what I saw, that's, you know, that's, I, you know, I've never seen it again since 2003, so um, I may never see it again, maybe I will see it again, I don't know, maybe you'll see it, I don't know. It, for me, it's, you know, it's an intrigue for me, but I'm not tr out there trying to solve it. I do believe you saw. Yeah. You saw what you yeah. saw. Yeah. Just what that was, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, that's what the mystery is, what was it? Yeah. You know, yes. so that's... That's the mystery, yeah. need a drink fairly badly. After his night on Omi Island, Ronan Coglin prepares for another encounter. But it's not a monster that awaits him, it's science. I've always felt that scientists who are in the mainstream of science have looked on cryptozoology askance, as it were. It's not the kind of thing, obviously, that you can say is part of mainstream science because it doesn't involve bringing things into a laboratory, putting them on a table and analyzing them. Well, science isn't really about going into a laboratory. Science, because, I mean, my science is all based in the field, but science is based purely on evidence. So everything that we record is based on, on, on what we see and what's there to be seen. And although there are aspects of the cryptozoology that would be um, perfectly acceptable because you're taking in records and, and um, examining them and so on, it's perhaps the idea that you're um, reading too much into it without actually having the evidence to back it. Is the Duvahu a physiological impossibility? All the descriptions of it point, apart from the size and the orange feet, point to it being a, um, an otter. The thing is, though, it's um, seven foot, eight foot? In, in yes, some go as far as nine foot, but I mean, people who see things, particularly if they see things in the dark or in bad light, uh, can um, make a mistake with uh, the estimate of That's length. That's exactly it, but the otter is um, four to five foot max. Four foot would be the average size of a male otter, and males are much bigger than females. and. Where, you, like all, um, like ourselves, you could have a very, very tall person. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't have a person that's twice the size of another person, no. and, and that's what this this Dover coup would be twice the size. Which makes is there any possibility of some kind of mutation? When a new species arises, very often it it derives from a mutation that survives and, and goes on to breed. But the fact that there are records of these animals going back historically means that n there's not just one of them, there are, a, there breeding are a breeding group of them, which means it makes it even harder to believe that they've never been, uh, that they're, they're 
the Mind Foundation. you, the ordinary otter is notoriously shy. I mean, I used to teach in a school which had an otter in a pond, and I never saw it once. For his part, Sean Corcoran hasn't taken a side in the debate between believers and skeptics. But one thing is certain. Whatever he saw that summer night in 2003 remains in the domain of the unexplained. Where there is some freak of nature that is a giant otter or a dove or coo of some kind that actually exists and is so shy that it only sometimes encounters humans, um, that's the closest thing that's ever been explained to me about what it could possibly be. The mystery continues. Like any good scientist, Dr. Colin Lawton likes to arm himself with evidence to support his claims. Oh, that's a magnificent one, isn't it? Yes. But I mean, an otter even of that size, you could, if you actually ran into one by accident, exaggerate its size considerably. Well, I think that's very likely what we're looking at here. I mean, this is the male otter, which is much bigger than the female. Um, this comes from our museum in the university. The description of the door coup is exactly what we're looking at here, except for the size and the feet. I think one can make easy mistakes about the color of the feet of an animal, because the feet of an animal, like an otter, will often be seen underwater, or at least not very clearly. So otters are nocturnal animals, so you, uh, it's most likely that they've been seen at yes. night, and so... Um, I mean, that looks just like descriptions of the Thuvaku, yeah. and people who started talking of the Thuvaku obviously thought they were talking about an otter, because that seems to be the original meaning of the word. You get a similar word for an ordinary otter in both Welsh and Breton, so uh, I think that um, uh, might be to some extent the answer, but I still think the occasional mutant could have arisen. It seems that this is, whatever it is, it's a creature that is living on the island and, and is going about the waters there, and as I say, it's something that we, we really don't know what it is. I, I think it's most likely to be a big otter that's, that's caught someone by surprise. Yes. That's my, my view. But if I were to see that in the water, I wouldn't think it was a doofa who, but I would be pretty impressed with its size. I'll keep to it might exist, but there might be several different explanations for its existence. Jackie Corcoran, the sister of Sean, remains skeptical but she admits that her brother is not the type to sink into storytelling. In short, the mystery remains unsolved. He would always have had his stories to tell, but I don't think he'd be a person who would be prone to exaggeration. He'd have a serious enough side to him, and he wouldn't be one to be uh, prone to practical jokes and that sort of thing. That wouldn't really be his, his style. I'm not a storyteller. I don't make up stories. I'm, uh, you know, I might tell a few yarns every now and again, but I'm not like, you know, I don't invent stories. So, I suppose most people I've told seem to seem to believe me. Whether maybe they go off and they'd say, "Hey, he's a bit, he's a bit cracked." Maybe I don't know. I looked up a dictionary of old Irish. That is to say, Irish is spoken in early medieval times. And while it lists "duva" who is meaning otter, it doesn't have the monstrous uh, "duva" who mentioned in it. That doesn't mean that nobody knew anything about it, but they weren't saying much if they did. The Corcorans return every summer to Omi Island, but now they're far more careful. We've gone more upmarket. We rent a house each time we go to the island now. Yeah, and we locked the door. We had a, there was a knock at the door, and we, we kind of thought, oh, that's strange, the tide has just closed. But it was a, a man with his two dogs, and he said, how do I get off the island? Well, you don't right now. You, you better come in for some tea, <laughs> because the tide had closed behind him. So, I mean, that whole kind of element of freedom and kind of like, a, you know, you have, you know, that's, I hope that never changes. And I think that's what people, when they come to Omi, they go away with lovely memories of all of that. And over, I suppose over the years as well, we see generation after generation coming back, you know, bringing their children and then their children's children. Like maybe in a hundred years time, there'll be a preservation order on the island where you'd need to buy a ticket to go onto the island. I hope that doesn't happen because the freedom of the island is just, it's just so simple and unspoilt. Yes, 
We did get lucky. We did see something that could be a mystical creature, but it isn't a mystical creature. It's real. He's real. The Omi creature is definitely real. Um, yeah, the luck of the Irish. Apparently, we do have a few strange phenomenons in our country. So we, we were lucky enough to see one, maybe. I hope someday that somebody will um, come up with something constructive as a result of it all and that we'll cease the memory of, 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 um, of wonder. Mm. Strange things in Ireland.